Hello again, Caboose here. This is the first in a series about the technology that makes the Battletech universe work. I'll do my best to explain everything as in-depth as I can, but bear in mind that there's going to be a certain amount of bullshit space magic that makes some things work. Also try to bear in mind that if you attempt to work on some of these devices yourself, I've been advised by Warp Angel to tell you that once you let the smoke out, it will quit working. First on our list is energy generation. We're going to skip the ultra basic what is energy segment and instead dive into how it gets made, distributed, and what it's used for. Now we all know the average battle mech is fusion powered, but what about battle armor? Or tanks? Atmospheric aircraft? Or even your average civilian car? Well, sit back and prepare to learn something, because here we go. Before we get into how it's used, we need to know how it's made. There are so many ways to create energy, some of them dating back millennia. Chief among those are what are referred to as kinetic generators. Put simply, it's a generator that you spin to make power. Put it in front of a stream of water, throw some aerodynamic blades on it, and put it in a windy environment. Hell, you can even attach it to a stationary bike or something similar in a pinch. Do these make a lot of power? No. But they are among the simplest to use, maintain, and manufacture, so they're common pretty near anywhere that has limited infrastructure. In a similar vein with kinetic generators, we have photovoltaic types. Simply put, add sun and position properly, and BAM! There's your power! They also don't produce a lot of energy, but with a theoretical max efficiency of around 80%, it's a pretty foolproof way to power low-draw items like lighting or computer equipment. And there are military field kits that you can employ to charge power packs and power cells out in the field. It doesn't do it quickly, but it does it very quietly, which is sometimes more important. Now onto the complicated methods that we have the internal combustion engine, or ICE. These are complex reciprocating piston designs that turn linear motion into rotational motion. Shortly after the inception of this engine type, they had it coupled directly to whatever needed moving via a complex system of pulleys or gears. Now though, almost everyone has it coupled with a kinetic generator and they route the output of that to whatever needs to be powered. There are also turbine-based ice designs that use the combustion of fuel to drive fan blades, which in turn drives a shaft that also in turn can drive whatever you need. These are more fuel-hungry, but also more efficient and can spin at higher speeds if that's what you need. As an aside, external combustion engines or steam engines do exist in remote areas. Though horribly inefficient, they are relatively simple to build and maintain. Steam power can drive whatever you need, whether being used to spin in turbine impellers or drive pistons. Even though it is inefficient, it's also very powerful, offering a surprising amount of torque per unit mass of fuel consumed. Fuel cells are another low-cost method of energy storage and generation. Typically, they use hydrogen gas, but they can use more complex hydrocarbon types too, like methane or propane, though these offer more toxic byproducts and are less favorable overall. Fuel cells are great for areas that need low to medium amounts of power and have limited infrastructure, with the primary output being drinkable water. I'll get to use cases a little later. Now, everyone knows about the Mighty Mobile Military Fusion Reactor, but before that we had Fission Reactors, which are still used today. Though they have a higher level of a more dangerous waste product than fusion, and they also require a supporting infrastructure and are far heavier, they are still a very efficient way to produce energy. Essentially, it's a nuclear steam generator. It creates heat, which is used to create steam to spin a turbine which spins a generator. Typically, these are seen in hardened, fixed installations, though they are also used in various spacefaring applications like space stations. Though they don't need to be refueled often, usually over a period of decades, the fuel is difficult to refine, heavy, toxic, and radioactive. And now on to the popular one, fusion. There are two main types of fusion reactors, one that produces heat to make steam, and another type that can use the magnetic containment as sort of a dynamo to directly generate energy. Both have heat as a byproduct, and fusion reactors used in military applications have a small steam turbine to capture and produce more power off some of this waste heat, which also serves to help keep it cool. The fuel can be anything that contains hydrogen, typically heavier isotopes like deuterium. Those stories about mech warriors peeing to refuel their reactors? Those aren't stories. So, if you're paying attention, basically no matter what the generation method, it's all to put out electrical power rather than mechanical motion. It's a lot easier to route cables and conduits than it is spinning shafts and U-joints. If mechanical motion is needed someplace, you just put an electrical motor there and problem solved. Depending on your needs, there are different levels of cabling available. 
Most civilian and light commercial needs use copper, aluminum, or some kind of high conductivity alloy. When you start getting into heavy commercial, industrial, and military needs, the differences start to blur between the two, and you get into heavy-duty superconductors like graphene or carbon nanotube-plated electrodes and other advanced lightweight cables and wires. In some instances, you'll also have wireless transmission, usually focused microwave beams. These can be tightly focused enough that it, until it reaches the receiver, the beam has about the cross-section of your finger. Once it hits the receiver, it can be converted into electricity. Granted, this is for fixed installations gathering power from orbiting power stations. It can't really be used in mobile vehicles for obvious reasons. And no, despite how it looks on paper, you can't repurpose one as a death ray. Anything remotely metallic dissipates the beam too fast, though it can cook organic matter in short order. However, even the smallest material can scatter or absorb the beam. Now we cover where certain generation types are used and what their most ideal use case is. To be clear, most energy generation types that don't depend on burning things with fire can be used just about anywhere, with fuel cells being an exception as those need an oxygen environment to operate. They could technically create their own oxygen, but that's a bit like trying to use an electric motor to spin a generator and power itself. So we'll start off simple. Solar and wind is basically used for infrastructure, with solo also being used to power low-draw spacefaring applications like sensor stations, orbiting habitat stations, or offsetting the use of basic needs like lighting or water pumping in places like orbiting manufacturing plants. And yes, you have portable solar, quote, plants, as I mentioned before. Those are extremely useful for long-term operations away from usable infrastructure, primarily scouting missions. Energy generation via IC engines, it's either that or say ice engines, as previously mentioned, is very inefficient compared to some alternatives presented by a higher technology base. What some armchair engineers out there fail to realize is, is that in many places there isn't a higher technology base. Remember me mentioning steam engines? That's not a fringe case or even that uncommon in deeper parts of the periphery. IC engines are necessary because they are cheaper to produce, rely on easy to obtain fuel, they'll run on basically anything combustible, and they don't require much specialized knowledge to maintain them. You can basically read a book on them and be able to fix most issues, provided you follow the instructions in order. They're used mostly in vehicles, ground cars, military tanks, even atmospheric fighters. Fun fact, atmospheric fighters are more effective than aerospace fighters in atmosphere, even when powered by combustible fuels. Now, atmospheric fighters are kind of their own animal, and I'll probably dive deeper into vehicles on another episode. The short version is, some of them directly harness the mechanical motion of the IC engine, while others are fine with an electric motor spinning a prop. There's propellers, rotors, turbines, impellers, all sort of aircraft out there. Shout out in the comments if you'd like me to dive into that. Believe it or not, mechs can be driven by IC engines as well. They weigh a lot due to the generator that has to accompany the engine itself, but it can be done. In fact, a lot of industrial mechs use IC engines just because they're easier to repair and maintain in the field as well as being cheaper. Only downside is, if you're using them in an oxygen deficient environment, you need to carry something that will allow the fuel to combust, making the engine more complicated and thus increasing the chance of something going wrong. You can also get a portable generator powered by internal combustion. You have manned portable versions that weigh anywhere from 10 to 100 kilos, and vehicle portable ones that can weigh multiple tons and power remote bases or even entire cities in a pinch. For portable power generation though, not much trumps fuel cells. They can be used just about anywhere you need power and scaled up to enormous sizes either by adding multiple smaller cells or engineering larger ones. The waste heat they produce is minimal, making them ideal for areas where venting heat can be problematic. This isn't just mechs, but in space, on military operations requiring some degree of stealth, and in closed areas like mines. In fact, fuel cell mining mechs are staggeringly popular for just that reason, and for the fact that a hydrogen fuel cell's output is essentially clean water. In the event of some kind of catastrophe, this greatly improves the worker's odds of survival. The fuel cell can power the systems that provide clean air to breathe, and the worker can simply drink the output to stay hydrated. Man portable fuel cells are slightly less common when a rechargeable power pack will typically do the same job with greater ease of reuse. However, when setting up new construction, operating heavy equipment, or even just providing backup power, the ease of use, sustainability, simplicity, and scalability of a fuel cell is hard to beat. Fission power is the opposite of most of those things. It isn't easy to use, simple or portable. It is, however, scalable and more or less sustainable. 
Basically, every planet is lousy with fissionable materials. You just have to have a reactor design you can deploy that can consume them. Uranium is the one most known, but maybe you have an excess of thorium instead. Or maybe it's a heavier isotope of uranium that is typically used elsewhere. Some fission reactors operate with no other reason than to make lighter isotopes that can fuel other reactors. What fission power does have going for it is an incredible lifespan and refueling cycle. You can engineer such a reactor to run for multiple decades without needing to be shut down. In fact, military fission reactors on things like marine vessels and submarines wouldn't need to return to port at all if they didn't need food. The immense power density that fissionable materials provide make it so that such craft can handle all their other operations and personnel needs. Fission power is great for orbital manufacturing expressly for that purpose. They're more expensive to build in that role just because of the sheer mass and you need to launch it all into orbit. But once they're there, they pay for themselves multiple times over due to the plant not needing to shut down until typically a major overhaul is needed anyway. And the big mamma jamma, fusion power. It's been around since 2018 thanks to GM's ordinary home fusion reactor, and they can be scaled up and down to nearly any size. There are even some special ops designs that are manned portable and about the size of a backpack for generating a ton of power in a short period of time. The clans even experimented with making a version of those reactors for use in their elemental suits. However, after containment failures a number of times and escaping jets of plasma and superheated air, either blowing a hole through the trooper or piercing the SRM reloads, they decided it wasn't worth the effort and developed a more energy-dense power cell instead. Everyone and their brother knows about fusion engines and battle mechs. Basically every dropship and jump ship is also fusion powered. But some things that may surprise you that share that trait are vehicles like cargo blimps, land trains, high speed trains, some helicopter designs, industrial mechs, security mechs, and believe it or not, some ground based factories are powered directly by their own reactors. Now, fusion power might seem like the holy grail of power, but it has its own drawbacks as well. The most obvious one is that it essentially takes a physicist to repair one. The knowledgeable person can get by, but for anything other than routine maintenance, a high degree of training is needed. They also generate a lot of heat, and that heat has to go somewhere. The hotter they get, the harder it is for them to continue to generate power effectively. That doesn't mean you should make one as cold as possible either, because they have to maintain plasma inside the reactor chamber. They have a fairly narrow operating range with some tolerance for going above it, but not much for going below it. Fusion is quite expensive at the outset as well, especially heavy industrial or military reactor designs, which need to endure significant amounts of abuse and stay operational. Now before I get too much further, I want to clear up one thing. Fusion reactors aren't explosive. Well, not in the sense that most people think they are anyway. They don't go critical and kaboom, like in so many Hollywood shows. You basically have one writer to thank for that trope, who shall remain nameless. If they're watching this, they know what they did. However, that's not to say that they don't explode, it's just different. A fusion reactor has a containment chamber that holds a high temperature plasma and is basically kept under vacuum. When that gets breached, it sucks in whatever air happens to be around it, superheats it to multiple orders of magnitude, and shoots it all back out about 4,000 times its previous volume. It looks spectacular and it's a violent, damaging process, but it's essentially a steam explosion. If you heated up a boiler empty and then added water, the same thing would probably happen and could definitely level a building. So there you have it, a mostly in-depth look at how you make energy in the world of Battletech. I glossed over some points here and there, and basically skipped energy storage because honestly, no matter what you call it, it's a battery. Power pack, power cell, lithium fusion, whatever. They all hold generated energy to be used later. The chemistry changes, the job remains the same. Next up is the structure of mechs, tanks, other vehicles, spaceships, and, well, structures. That one is going to be just a bit more involved because of the material engineering that goes into it, but it'll be good, I promise. So, stay tuned, and thanks for watching. Until next time, maybe I'll see you on the battlefield.